Right, I'm going to um, come down from these um, probably rather more interesting and lofty heights of sort of proposal and, and big ideas and um, try to think a bit more about some of the mechanics of how any of this might be incorporated into some of the current political processes in this area and to think a little bit about sort of fitting together some of these ideas um, with some of the ideas about what type of agreement we might see in the um, post-2015 era, what it might do, who might be agreeing it, and, and so on, and try to sort of think about some of the politics of this. Um, no? You want me to click? Yeah, just... It's not working. Yes, please. Okay, next one. <laughs> Right, I think um, we're, trying, we're talking about economic growth today. Obviously, that's you know just one part of the, all of the range of conversations that are going on around a post-2015 um, agreement. There are also separately conversations going on around how health might fit in or education or infrastructure, a whole range of different things. Um, I think it's probably worth saying at the beginning that there's a... Um, there's a lot of argument that economic growth, you know, as Ralph has just said, that economic growth hasn't had a sort of sufficient place in the MDGs and it's provided a set of slightly sort of strange incentives for donors and others to, in a sense, to deprioritize economic growth. And we've got to remember that the MDGs that we have now were born into an era, the era of structural adjustment um, and of, you know, a very different kind of understanding around economic development policy where arguably there was too much focus on, on growth really as the sort of single key indicator and the MDGs to some extent were a move away from that and really important in broadening our understanding of economic development exactly in some of the ways that, that, that Kate was arguing for. So while I think, you know, there is an argument there about the sort of strange impact that's had on, on aid allocations and donor incentives and on politics, we have to be careful that we're not arguing for simply a lurch back to that previous era that the MDGs were actually a reaction to, and, and many of us would have thought, thank goodness for that. So to be kind of intelligent about the way that we're applying this debate, I think. Generally, I think, the politics, this is stepping away really from the post-2015 debate and just trying to situate it in the sort of politics and debates around economic growth um, more generally in the world. It strikes me, just thinking about it, um, that really we're having three quite separate conversations about economic growth, and your view on this question depends very largely on where you sit. That in Europe, and, and to some extent the USA, obviously the thing that's obsessing us at the moment is nothing to do with greenness or inclusivity or anything else. It's just growth. It's just how to get you know economies growing again um, and a sense of sort of dynamism into the economy we're much less I mean arguably politicians are less worried now than they were a few years ago about the issues that Kate was talking about about decoupling and all the rest of it and they just would like some growth please thank you very much <laughs> I think you know in Afrim these are these are caricatures clearly and generalizations and there's there's a far greater degree of nuance in all these places but in Africa, it seems to me, from the sort of conversations I've been having and the meetings that I've been in, the real focus is on less on growth per se, because a lot of African countries, as we know, have really healthy, you know, very, very rapid growth rates. But the focus is very much on jobs and how to get good jobs from that growth. With the, you know, we're seeing growth, but the issue there is that it's not doing the things that, you know, exactly as Ralph said, in in Tunisia, in, in North Africa particularly, and also in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we're not seeing the kind of impact particularly on jobs that people want to see and that governments need them to see in order to maintain stability and, and do the things that they want to do. And in Asia, I think, in fact, after I wrote this slide, I thought this isn't really Asia, this is really East Asia. It's informed by you know, a series of meetings I've been, at in, I've been in, in in East Asia over the, over the last month or so. It seems to me that, again, they have growth, there are issues there around China and a sort of concern about whether that growth, the extent to which that growth can be maintained. The growth has generated um, income growth, jobs and so on, to perhaps a greater degree than it has in Africa. But there are increasing concerns, partly about the environmental impact of that growth. It's starting to have an impact on people's lives. You know, we know about pollution in Beijing, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a growing concern about inequality. And I think there are sort of growing issues there around the the fairness and the distribution of issues around that growth. So it seems to me that 
you know, we are uh, how you the, the priority, the sort of extra word that you want to attach to growth. You know, the whether it's inclusive, is it green? Really, very much depends on where you sit. And in thinking about the politics of this, in what will be, after all, a global negotiation or a global conversation, it really helps to remember that in terms of what it is that governments are going to want out of an agreement, in terms of informing their own policies and their own outcomes, it's going to vary quite a lot. Right, next one. So, um, so what are the politics? Right, after, uh, after Rio, we are left with two um, international processes going on, running almost exactly in parallel. We have, um, in the post-2015 sort of post-MDGs debate, we have the, the high-level panel, which, as we know, will be chaired by, by David Cameron and also by the presidents of Liberia and Indonesia. Um, the terms of reference for that, for that panel have not yet been fully laid out, but the best thing that we have to sort of guide us there is the report of the UN task team, which was in a sense commissioned to write the report that's the first thing that lands on the desks of the high level panel when they start their job. And there the focus, um, they, they've sort of organised their work around three principles, around human rights, equity and sustainability. So you can see straight away that there is a potentially quite a strong overlap between what we might assume the sort of post the, the high level panel would see as their post 2015 agenda and some of the issues that the second process that that was established in in Rio uh, last week um, is is going to be address is going to be addressing which is the whole debate around the sustainable development goals again Rio mandated the setting up of an intergovernmental group 30 members drawn from equally from f five different regions recognized by within the UN system um, and their mandate again not entirely clear um, the sort of the range of the remit of their conversations what it is they're going to be talking about but some of the original proposals around the sustainable development goals had not just the sort of traditional environmental areas around oceans and forests and climate change, but also interest, you know, also a proposal to establish, you know, to think about um, about jobs, about gender equity, and so on. Some of the areas that, you know, also would overlap very strongly with some of the things that we would want to see in a sort of human development focused post 2015 MDGs agenda. So we now have these two um, these two processes set up with, you know, where the starting point, in a sense, is quite a high degree of overlap between the the remit of the two um, of the two panels. They're both going to start work in September of this year and report back to the UN General Assembly next year in 2013. Um, so we have the all the the ingredients of either a, a car crash. <laughs> Or, you know, or potentially, if a division of labour between the two could be worked out, a kind of really interesting dynamic exploration and full sort of opportunity to really fully um, understand the issues involved in two of these sort of areas where global public action is absolutely crucial. One in the area of development and poverty and one in the area of the environment and climate change. Now, you know, I'm an incorrigible optimist and I... I can see a good outcome here. I can see many bad outcomes. I can see a good one as well. Paul is laughing. <laughs> <laughs> um, the things that we don't know yet um, about these things, which are the sort of mechanics of how they're going to operate and are obviously going to largely determine whether we do see the, the, you know, the many bad outcomes or the one possible good outcome from this process, is you know, we say we don't know the terms of reference of either group. We don't really know what their remit is, how how restricted they're going to be in terms of what it is they discuss. We don't know what kind of support they're going to get, um, who they're going to be advised by, where their sort of support structures and secretariats are going to sit institutionally, where they're going to be drawn from. Again, that, um, that will affect the outcome. And the other thing we don't know is the politics of the two groups, um, the level of buy-in that each is going to get from other member states not represented in either group, um, the level of impact that each is going to have in terms of their own national level discussions or the global global architecture and we don't know you know what the level of engagement is going to be of the members of the people actually on each panel are they really going to go and care about the outcome or is it going to be a kind of rubber stamping exercise um, there's a massive amount of unknowns here to some extent you know these discussions are happening now um, 
I guess you know there's possibly room to to you know to to influence some of that on the margins, possibly not. Right. What might they? What, what are some of the outcomes that we might expect, assuming that this process comes to some conclusion, <laughs> um, and um, and that we get some kind of agreement? I'm just going to quickly sketch in in my last three slides um, what some of those possible outcomes might be. I mean, in relation to the sticking with the post 2015 process the sort of debate around what kind of goals we might want in relation to growth and employment within a framework which is largely focused on achieving <coughs> outcomes in the area of poverty and development. Um, what are the three sort of directions that the debates, the kind of debates that, that Kate and Rolf and others are having seem to be pointing in? I think there are three possible, not necessarily mutually exclusive, ways in which such an agreement could have an impact on the processes of growth and employment globally. The first, obviously, is to establish norms at a sort of very broad level to, that start to act probably quite slowly to change behaviour, <coughs> to change policies, to change the, the kinds of um, uh, the lobbying and advocacy behaviour of civil society organisations, to change the way that governments relate to each other. To some extent, you know, one could say that the... Um, the human, the, 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 some of the human rights agreements have worked in this way. So they, you know, some of them have become actually embedded within legal processes. Others have remained at the level of sort of global norm setting and have just very slowly changed the way that we think and the assumptions that we make about what policy should be for. That's one possibility. A second possibility is is where we really focus on an agreement which gets us to the heart of some of the areas where we really need global cooperation and global partnership. And we have an agreement which is really the point of the agreement, the extra thing that it gives us, is the opportunity to unlock some very tricky global issues that governments, single governments can't do on their own. So we all know about the disaster that's befallen the WTO's Doha round, that's, you know, paralysed without necessarily hope of agreement. There is a, you know, even one step back of deep reluctance to even discuss issues of global migration, for example. Um, and no serious prospect of getting, at the moment, any sort of broader international process on, on migration policy. Similarly, there are many problems with global um, agreements on intellectual property that you know, could usefully benefit from, from some changes. Now, I don't think, I think, you know, there are good, these are all incredibly political, difficult political issues. There are good reasons why governments haven't reached agreement on any of these things, because they're really, really difficult to do. And I think we should be cautious about sort of thinking that somehow or other some a post-2015 agreement can come and unlock all these really, really impossible issues. But it may be possible that one could pick off a few of the sort of parts of these separate issues that would be of particular benefit in terms of achieving poverty and development objectives, and yet possibly politically on the less controversial end of the spectrum and possibly you know, one can imagine an agreement that could put together some sort of combination of, of specific um, global deals there. And then the third possible outcome, again, would be something which focused very much on providing a framework for national level accountability and encouraging sort of national level policy, uh, policy attention, resource allocation, and so on, in specific directions or in the area of growth and, um, and employment. I mean, something, you know, this could be, for example, as Kate suggested, this could be national level targets on decoupling growth from, from carbon emissions, for example, or national level targets in relation to the provision of some of the specifics of a social floor. Um, one minute, Claire. Oh, God. OK, next one. <laughs> OK, SDGs. Well, we're much less... The, the debate on, it, on SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, is much less... Um, uh, is much less... There's been few, mainly fewer kind of proposals and much less debate around the content and within an agreement, so this is quicker. I think really where we're sort of where where at the moment this discussion seems to be going, and as I say, I think there's a great deal of uncertainty and it could go off in many different directions. Just looking within the debate on sustainable development goals at the different ways in which we're looking at the sort of treatment of national resu natural resource use and trying to limit natural resource use, assuming that that's one of the kind of underlying objectives of a set of sustainable development goals. I think there are two kind of models that we have. In, on the table at the moment. The first is where we, it, what I've called here the sustainable energy for all model, where we have something which is still focused around 
the, the ultimate objective of the goal or set of goals is still around achieving outcomes for people. So in the question of sustainable energy for all, it's about you know getting sustainable, getting energy to people. But we're, we're laying down within that goal targets for doing that in a particular way, which involves reducing the resource use. So that sort of, tr you know, lay using the sustainable development goals model as a way of encouraging governments to achieve their objectives in a certain way, which reduces resource use. The second possible model is around actually treating resource use as the objective of the agreement and having global targets around um, the pollution in the oceans, global targets around carbon emissions and so on, where the resource use is actually the end, the objective of the agreement rather than the means to achieve something else. As I say, there's a massive amount of uncertainty here. We really, and there could be, you know, this time next year, there could be another three things on that list. We just don't know yet. Right, next one. So where's this all heading? Um, anybody who's seen me speak in the last six months would have seen this picture before. Um, this is, I think, at the moment, both in relation to the MDGs and the SDGs, we're heading for three different possible types of agreement. <coughs> Christmas tree, which is the long list where everybody gets what they want, but in the end it's all a bit pointless because we've got 50 different goals and governments don't really pay attention to any of them. A jigsaw, which is where we get an agreement which is trying to solve a number of different big global problems simultaneously. So the SDGs at the moment look rather like this, you know, the, the sort of proposals that I've seen for SDGs where we're looking both at sort of big environmental objectives around carbon emissions and, and at poverty objectives, development objectives. Um, again, you know, technically, politically that, you know, that might be it's a very satisfying type of agreement. It all depends on whether the politics are right and whether you're trying to stitch together things which in the end the politics are so wrong that you jeopardise what you could get by trying to pursue the sort of perfectibility of an agreement. The third is the bullseye, where you just say, okay, we'll just do one thing at a time. We'll try, for example, to just have a post-2015 agreement which is focused on ending extreme poverty. Um, and we will, you know, we will do that by setting very stringent goals on ending um, income poverty of below $1.25 a day and so on. There are a number of proposals on the table for that. I mean, I think in the end, one can imagine good outcomes of either the jigsaw or the bullseye possible framework, and really the difference between them is in the politics, which is the least known part of this whole process. So I'm leaving you with a deep uncertainty. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much.